All right, good morning. I want to say welcome to Woodland. Glad you could make it today. Uh, we are excited to have you here, excited to be here together, gathered to worship. Um, my job is to welcome you, get some announcements out to your brain, and um, we're excited to continue with the ministry team interviews. Uh, last week I got to go first and talk about the guest services and outreach team, and uh, someone accused me of going first so that I would get the most volunteers. Her initials were Jen Scott, uh, but, um, but it's not like that at all. It's so exciting for, you know, if you're saying, how does the church work, or how can I plug in? And um, just like a, a good basketball team has short, fast kids and tall kids and beefy kids and kids that can dribble and like a, a good team uh, together, that's what our, we are here as a church body and there's a place for you. So today we're going to learn more about the missions team and what they do and uh, continue to think about and pray about where you could serve and why God has you here uh, at Woodland and how you can serve the body. I uh, also want to remind you that the baby bottle campaign is going on for the Pregnancy Resource Center in Medford. And I thought this was a little visual. It's probably too small for you guys to see back there. But the before and after, the empty bottle and then a bottle full of change or cash. And just I thought of the analogy of how some of the women that go there, like they're really empty. They're really in a dark place. And the hope that um, is provided through the Pregnancy Resource Center uh, is a great ministry. So um, there's more bottles back in the back if you need them, and uh, we're looking to return them February 20th. Okay, uh, I have another reminder here that tomorrow night is the annual meeting here at church. There are, if you wonder what goes on at an annual meeting, there are packets in the back uh, on the kiosk in the lobby. There's reports from each ministry team. There's financial stuff in there. There's an agenda in there. Uh, so you can see kind of what's going on and what we'll be doing. And again, all are invited. And uh, if there's just votes and things, then only the partners can participate in that. But you're all welcome to attend that annual meeting tomorrow night at 6.30. All right. Um, another fun, exciting announcement. Uh, the ladies' Bible study is beginning Friday, February 18th. So uh, there's a table in the back as well uh, for ladies to check out more information or to sign up. And they are going at 6.30 a.m. on Friday mornings for eight weeks. I heard that. I heard that. Yeah. I've heard that there's been like 17 to 20 women doing that for a long time. So uh, not a big deal. But that's great for those that maybe can work in your schedule better to do morning. So check out that table in the lobby uh, if you need more information. Okay, today, uh, another housekeeping thing. We're excited that Discoveryland family... Sunday school will be in the Grove, and adult Sunday school will be in this room here. So a little switch, all right, and kids, families, we are playing Who Wants to Be a Candy Heir? It's a little, yeah, raise your hats, right. Uh, some adults too, all right. Um, so it's a little spinoff of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? We have a special guest host for the game show. You will not want to miss that in the Grove at 1030, and adults here. So. Normally, we're flipping stuff in here, so just if you're a chair helper stacker person, we're just going to stack the outer two after church today, and we'll leave these for the adult Sunday school and for the annual meeting uh, for tomorrow night. So if, if you still want to help stack some chairs, the outer two after church, outer two banks can go against the wall. Okay. I think I made it through all the announcements. Thanks for listening. Let's worship together. Good morning, Woodland family. So I was uh, <clears throat> just looking back on this because there are a lot of faces in the room that, that I don't recognize. And in fact, the last time that, that my family and I were up here leading worship uh, was May 23rd. It's been a minute. Um, so I'm Dan. I'm new here. I'm interested in filling out a visitor card. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's, I was thinking about being back uh, with Woodland family, and we've gotten to attend sporadically. That's the best word I can think. It's been so sporadic. I, I, yeah. Uh, but thinking about getting back with the Woodland family, and I, I, I've been giddy. Like, I, I am I'm sweating. Uh, Be glad you're out there and not up here. <laughs> Because I love worshiping with you. 
So could we stand together and, and we'll shake all the little jitters out and we'll all sweat together like a happy family. Family that sweats together stays together. <laughs> sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder claims us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all comes up. Okay. Wow. This is fun. Yes, it is. Yeah. He's talking about sweating. <laughs> sweating? <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're at a fun time of year, and it's cold outside, but inside there's all kinds of things going on, and this is a time of the year when we're thinking about our church family, especially, I can't see all of you especially our ministry team leaders. There are nine of you, actually there's eight of you because a couple, one of you does two teams. Um, actually, there's seven of us right now. Okay, we have a need. Uh, yes, we do. Right. 
Uh, but these, these are the, the men and women who lead our different ministries here at the church. And Ira and I are talking because you lead our missions team. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the missions team? Who are you? What do you do? And, and what should we know? Well, the missions team is made up of the partners of the church, uh, and uh, I'd just like to have uh, those who are on the missions team just stand, the ones that are here, uh, so we could, you could recognize some of the people who are on the missions team. Paul Quidno on the back, he's our newest member, Karen Rush over here, and Tammy Everson, and myself are here this morning, and uh, uh, Viv Angelo, uh, Brad Eitzen are not able to be here this morning, uh, those are a few others, so, and uh, well, we exist, what we exist for is we, we seek to stimulate uh, you, our church body, uh, when it comes to world missions. Um, we exist to maintain contact with the Woodland-supported uh, missionaries and then to bring them before this church body uh, so that you can be informed and also be praying for them. And then we just seek to promote uh, and encourage missions opportunities both short-term and long-term. Those are our basic goals. Why wow. it exists. So how, how does our missions team help us participate in what God is doing around the world? Because this is a far-reaching team. You guys are helping us think about really the, the, the whole world. Yeah. It's, uh, I was thinking about that. I've been reading in Matthew uh, mm. recently. And, of course, uh, in Matthew 18, I think it is, where... You, where uh, uh, leave the 99 and go seek the lost sheep. And that's God's heart, is that, that not anyone would perish, but all come to repentance, and that his heart is there. And then, of course, in Matthew 28, uh, we hear what's called, what we commonly call the Great Commission, and uh, where uh, Christ exhorted his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And that's a we could almost use the word mandate <laughs> for us as uh, believers to, to go and to go to our neighbors, to go to the world beyond and then go completely around the world. And so that's, uh, that's the heart of, heart of God. And we, uh, we try to be encouraging and uh, supporting and praying for those who are called to go. Uh, we're all called to go to our neighbors, but for some, they have to go uh, much further, uh, even around the world. But not everybody can go. And so we have a part here that we play in, uh, uh, by supporting and encouraging and caring for those missionaries who are called to go. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a group of uh, missionaries who, who are literally in different places around the world. And something that I guess I would encourage us all with is that remember that you share in that fruit. Mm -hmm. If you give, if you pray, uh, if you're part of this church body, you share in that fruit. That's happening all around the world. Hmm. So I've counted nine missionary families that we, we support, as well as two entities. Mm -hmm. um, is that your count? Nine? Nine or ten. Or nine or ten? Yeah, we haven't counted, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's close to ten. Nine is close to ten. Here's a couple of the places that, you know, <laughs> we should know, right? <laughs> A couple of the places that uh, we have missionaries uh, uh, right here in Westboro, uh, right uh, in Wisconsin, a couple of different places, uh, Minnesota, uh, Spain, Mexico, British Columbia, uh, Poland. Um, yeah, we had one recently in India and uh, Uganda. So mm. those are some of the places that mm. we support. Mm. So how can can others in our church family join our mission team. What is there to do, and, and how can we be part of what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Well, in many ways, this church does already, because this, this church is uh, a mission-minded church, and we're really grateful for that. But uh, mostly, go and make disciples in your own community, um, and, uh, and then you can support missions and pray. Um, it's, not, it's a time we can highlight. There is a missions fund that for some, re for some, re for some reason has a heart especially for missions. They can give to that fund right through the church here. Otherwise, we want to make sure you're giving to the general fund, but that's always an option if you have extra you want to give. And then we use that money to help support and encourage our missionaries. Uh, if for some reason you would feel God leading you to go, uh, 
or participate in missions some ways, please let us know. And we'd like to consider that and see what we could do to help care and support you. Sure. And we do send out trips this summer, a youth trip. And yeah. In the past, we've planned and we'll again plan to send out a, a mm -hmm. church-wide trip in the summertime. And so yeah. there's ways that we can join in that. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that in the future here about the, the short-term missions trip this summer. But uh, we love to be a part of that. And uh, the encouragement that Jesus left us with yeah. at the end of the Great Commission uh, was he said uh, that I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, we're not going alone. Uh, and when we go into missions, whatever that is, uh, we have Christ with us and he'll be with us. So yeah. thank you. Can we, pr can we pray for our missions team? Absolutely. Let's do that. Thank Father, thank you for these men and women who care deeply about what you're doing around the world, but also in our neighborhood. It's, it's, they're not in conflict. What you do in our neighborhood is also what you're doing around the world. And uh, we would ask your blessing on this team, help them in their, in their meetings. And if you would send new people to serve with Ira and those on the missions team, then that would, that would be a very pleasing thing. And uh, we would ask that you would bless our, our nine missionary families, help them in their times of transition and their times of fruitfulness, as well as their times of struggle, and help us to be a church that knows how to support them and has your heart for the ends of the earth. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, speaking of missions, our uh, missionary emphasis this week is uh, Doug and Sherry Anderson. They serve up in British Columbia uh, to First Nations people. And uh, they got a few uh, uh, prayer concerns that they like to, to support them and, um, and pray with them, along with them about. Um, first off, um, they're praying for just their camp director, Dan, and his wife, Geneva, as they look forward to opening camp this summer um, up at, at their camp called Rock Nest Ranch. And so they're just praying for just vision casting and, and all the plans that go in, into that. And they have a special need for uh, staff up at their camp, whether that's year-long, short-term, or full-time staff. And so we can be praying for that, for that ministry. Um, they are also part of a church up there called Kaya. They've been meeting at, through Zoom still to this day since COVID started. And so uh, it's been going relatively well, but they are continuing to pray for uh, just the opportunity to be meeting back in person finally after such a long stint here of being over Zoom. Um, they're also going to be, as a church, the Kaya Church is also going to be going through 21 days of transforming prayer as a church body in February. And so... Uh, they just ask that we would support them in prayer, just ask that that would be a, a time of renewal, of, of, of reconnecting, and just seeking God's will as a church family. Um, Doug and Sherry also are planning to come back stateside this year sometime, and so just praying for those details to be worked out, and then we might even see them here this year sometime. So let's be keeping um, our, our missionary couple up in, in British Columbia in our prayers this week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are, for being a God who cares for us no matter where we live, no matter what we're doing. You are with us. You have promised to be with us. And as we serve you in the different capacities you've gifted us with and you led us into, Lord, help us to rest in that assurance that uh, you are among us, that you are living in and through us, and that you are a help in our uh, day of, of trouble. When we, when we need your help, Lord, you are by our side and so, Lord, we just we rest in that knowledge uh, of you being with us. And we just pray, Lord, this morning, as we open your word, as we lift our voices, as we go to you in spirit and in truth, Lord, that we would rest in you, Lord, that we would find great delight in being your sons and your daughters, and that we have an assurance in heaven um, that cannot be taken away from us. So, Lord, speak to us to, uh, th uh, this morning. Help us to, to follow you and obey you with our hearts, minds, and souls. We give this morning to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, uh, I'm the, we're at the end of January now, and in case you were keeping track. And we 
we have a discussion at the end, somewhere around December 26, where I say, it's time for the tree to come down. <clears throat> and Jamie says, no, <laughs> we can keep it up. And I said, no, it's, it's, Christmas is done. And in fact, like December 25, if we're at home and we're, we finish the presents, okay, tree can come down now. That's me. I'm sorry, Amanda, if that offends sorry. you. Um, but I, I do have it on good authority. What's that? Oh, it's the opposite. I see. <laughs> I do have it on good authority, though, that, that January 6, that's when it's socially unacceptable to keep your tree up, right? Like. That yeah. you, have to, you have to take it down January 6th. You have to. So if it's still up right now, like if you have the plastic trees and you, and you still got it going, like it's time. Like it's, January's over. We are going to do a Christmas song right now, though. Um, the, the whole lead up for that. Uh, but really, to me, it's, it's a celebration of the end of the Book of Acts song. It's, we are at the end of the Book of Acts. And, and so what we celebrate at Christmas is like Acts. We get to the end of Acts and we say... Wow, Jesus said he was coming, he came, and then he went away, and we were sad, but now it's, it's us, and this hope for everyone is now resting in the church that he created, and so when I, when I sing this song, and that's the sign of a good Christmas song for me, if you can sing it all year round. To me, this speaks of, this isn't a Christmas song. This is a, let's go. Let's bring hope to the world. Let's, let's see, uh, let's hear the angels sing the rest of the year. And maybe they need our voices to join in. <clears throat> so we say, hear the angels sing. There's hope for everyone. Announce our King. There's hope for everyone. What good news they bring. There's hope for everyone. Angels sing. There's hope for everyone. They came from afar. There's hope for everyone. Wise men saw.
never know what we're going to talk about when Dan gets up here. <laughs> so let's talk about Christmas. It was the beginning of Advent 2018 that we began our series on Luke Acts. So that's a little more than three years ago. Now to be fair... We've talked about a lot of things since then. We talked about Philippians, James, Ruth, and there was this little thing called COVID that slipped in after we got going. When we started talking about Acts, we were thinking about engagement. We were going to send a team to Mexico. Remember that? We're still going to do that. But we were planning that. We were, we were, we were looking outward and then the world changed, right in the middle of what we were doing. And, you know, we needed acts in the last three years, because even though we thought that we were reaching out to the ends of the earth, we needed to look outward in our own community, even, even in our own families, even within ourselves, and acts has helped us do that. And... Today we're going to say goodbye to an old friend because in three years you can really get used to something. And this has been our, our pathway in, a, in a, a, a larger sense, even though we've done other things. We get to say goodbye to Acts today, but not really because it's all about the Christian life and it's all about our witness and it's all about the Spirit and it's all about Jesus. Open your Bibles, if you would, to... The very end of Acts, Acts 28, we're going to look at verses 17 to 31 today. If you remember, Paul has arrived in Rome. He got there by appealing to Caesar, a really weird way to get to visit Emperor Nero. But he appealed to Caesar in his various defenses, and God brought him through in fulfillment of Acts 1.8. Remember that key verse all the way at the beginning, and you will receive power. Has that happened? Yeah. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, yeah, that happened. You'll be my witnesses. Has that happened? Yes. In Jerusalem, check. And in all Judea and Samaria, check and even to the end of the earth. And in some measure, we get to check that box today, in some measure. Rome is the symbolic end of the earth. It's the most powerful city, the center of the known world in, in ancient times. And it's the beginning place for the gospel to actually go to every corner of the earth. And so today we have an ending that is followed by a new beginning, and we'll talk about both of those. So Acts 28, let's finish the book. Verse 17. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people, or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. 
but because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging for in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disbelieving among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed. They have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And so we are at an ending to the book of Acts, and we want to notice a few things in this passage, a few things to notice here in the last passage. Number one, thing number one. You've got some numbers on your little, your little insert if you want to, your little slip if you want to keep up. Thing number one, God works things out. God works things out, things out. Remember where Paul came from? He was on the Damascus Road, struck blind by the very presence of Jesus. How is God going to work this out? Well, he was sent to, An to Ananias, Ananias. And, who, and his eyes were opened, and he believed in Jesus. Actually, I think he believed in Jesus right when he saw him. But his eyes were opened spiritually and materially, and he was changed. God works things out. Then he was ignored and feared by the believers in Antioch. How's God going to work this out? He sent Barnabas. Barnabas said, come here, Paul. I've got something for you to do. And Paul was put into action. God works things out. Then he was attacked for 27 years by my count. For 27 years he was attacked by his former colleagues. And then finally the Romans arrested him. And he stood before Felix, before Festus, before Herod Agrippa. And now soon Emperor Nero. God works things out. The very people that arrested him protected him. Think about that. For years. How ironic. God works things out. Then he was in the storm at sea. How's God going to work this out? He was shipwrecked. God works things out. Again, how ironic. And then when his ship ran aground on Malta, God used the shipwreck to draw attention to Paul's witness. God works things out. And now he's in Rome in his very own apartment where he has freedom to teach and to Right, and he has access to the most powerful officials in the whole world. At the end of Philippians, which was written during this time, he closes the letter by saying, All the saints greet you, you believers at Philippi, especially those of Caesar's household. Only God could work this out in the way that he worked this out. God works things out. What do we know about Paul's surroundings? At this time, well, he was in Rome, okay. Rome was the largest city in the ancient world. A million people. That's not a small city even today, but it was absolutely enormous in that day. 
There were 20 to 50,000 Jews in Rome. All had been expelled about 10 years earlier in 50 AD by Emperor Claudius. And you remember Priscilla and Aquila? When, when Paul meets them in Corinth, we get that little explanation in Acts 18, 1 and 2 about how they'd been part of the, the diaspora of Jews who had been expelled um, from Rome. Now the Jews had been allowed to resettle, and they had clustered, ancient sources tell us, in two settlements, and there was a kind of a disorganized network of 11 different synagogues, and it's likely that Paul's apartment was in one of these neighborhoods. They were densely packed neighborhoods, not the best place to live in Rome, narrow little streets, people living on top of each other, and in the, and in the middle of this cluster of humanity, Paul gets to rent his apartment and probably chained to his Roman soldier friend. He got to receive visitors and he got time to, to write and to teach how like God to work this out. God works things out. Second thing to notice here is that Paul teaches two main ideas and the ideas are important and they're given to us twice. He starts teaching after three days. If it were me, I would have asked the Roman soldier to take me to Ikea. And we would have gone and gotten some furniture and gotten set up. Not Paul. After three days, he starts teaching right away. And he gives testimony to what God has done. And he gives an explanation for why he's there. It's because of the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. He speaks the language of the Jews who are around him at the time. And they think about this a little bit, and then they come back later in greater numbers, and he teaches two main ideas. First of all, the kingdom of God. This was Jesus's big theme. Yes, we're saved by faith in Jesus, but when Jesus was on the earth, he talked about the kingdom of God. In Luke 16, 16, also part of this study. Jesus said, The law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. The good news is that the king is finally here. And after his death, burial, and resurrection, he reigns. And he enters the heart of men with difficulty. Because people don't want to believe right away. I think that's what it means when it says it forces his way, and everyone forces his way into it. The good news is also that the king is coming back to take over. And when the king returns, he will exercise his rule. The kingdom of God is about the the reign and rule in the kingdoms of this earth as well as in human hearts. And until or Jesus comes, the kingdoms of this world are going to continue to crumble. The Roman Empire is going to crumble. The Holy Roman Empire in the Middle Ages is going to crumble. The Ottoman Empire, modern times, is going to crumble. British Empire and all the empires of the modern West and East are going to crumble until Jesus returns and the kingdom is here in fullness. And the king will have dominion over rulers and over the hearts of men and women. Kingdom of God, Paul's big theme because it was Jesus' big theme. Secondly, do you notice what else he taught? He simply taught Jesus as foretold in the law and the prophets. And that's because Jesus is how you enter the kingdom Notice that he preaches Jesus from the Old Testament. Even though he's writing his epistles, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, is still the Bible of the day. And Paul's life and writings, as well as the lives and writings of others, will become the New Testament. But after the kingdom of God, he simply talks about the king. He talks about Jesus. Those two themes are the second thing we should notice. Thing number three, Paul never loses zeal for his brother Israelites. He never loses zeal 
for his fellow Jews. Going all the way back three years, remember when we were in Luke 2? That was a great way to begin Advent. You can only do it once, though. Start Luke right at Christmas time. At Christmas time, we, we read Luke 2, 34, when Jesus was circumcised and dedicated at the temple. And Simeon blessed them, Mary and Joseph, and said to Mary, his mother, because this child is, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Jesus is going to divide God's people Israel. Some are going to follow him and some won't. Luke 13, after Jesus is being mostly rejected, he says, Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You've rejected me. I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. Then you're going to Except me, some of you, many of you, but you've been rejected because you've rejected me. And then in Romans 11, written shortly before our passage here, Paul, in, in holding out hope and desiring for the salvation of his fellow Jews, said, So I ask you, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Imagine his fist coming down on the table when he says this. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? And Paul is looking forward to a time when there's going to be a great turning to Christ from among his fellow Jews, and that's going to happen. And until that happens, his heart is zealously seeking out his fellow Israelites. But it doesn't happen in the book of Acts. Notice how it ends. Some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. Jesus has divided Paul's audience again, just like he divides people today, those who trust him and those who harden themselves against him. And Paul is again rejected by most because of Jesus. But the book doesn't end on this down note, does it? What's going to happen now? That's the fourth thing to notice here. Gentiles will respond to the gospel. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Again, back to Romans 11, now verse 26. Paul talks about Gentiles. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of of the Gentiles has come in. God is going to send his gospel and his witnesses to every tribe and nation, and the fullness of his people will come in, both Jew and Gentile, and Jesus will return, and God will be all in all. But Paul's work is almost done, and his witness will be taken up by others through the centuries. It's going to pass down through the centuries until it comes to you and me. And we depend on Paul's testimony as well as the testimony of others who knew and walked with Jesus and saw him. The Gentiles are going to respond. And in the end, Paul's brother, Israelites, are going to respond too. What happened to Paul? It's a little bit unsatisfying, isn't it? I mean, we want to... We want to see, like, you know, something, 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 the end. But, but we don't get that, partly because the story is still going on, still going on today, in fact. But Luke stops here. And there are different reasons or different speculations why Luke stops 
here, one of, one of my teachers believes, and I've mentioned this, that Luke-Acts was a kind of trial brief for Paul, and it was completed just before his trial. That's the reason it ends. It, it's more likely, probably, that Luke stops here because his account deals with the gospel going to the end of the earth, and in some measure, that has been accomplished now that Paul is witnessing in Rome. We are told that Paul stayed in prison for two years, and during this time, we're not told this, but we, we know this, putting the pieces together, that during this two years, he wrote Ephesians, aren't we glad we have that book, and Colossians, and Philemon, and Philippians that we've talked about within recent memory here at Woodland. At the end of Philippians, Paul seems to indicate that he's about to be released. Clement, who is not a biblical writer, but who was kind of like the senior pastor of Rome, in the second half of the first century, he died in 99 AD, he says that Paul was executed in Rome in the late 60s. So Paul is writing here, or our passage is in 60 AD. Clement is not inspired, but he was sure a lot closer to the events of the day in time and in place than we are, so I tend to believe Clement. We also still need an explanation for where 2 Timothy came from. And, and in 2 Timothy, it, it ends very different than Philippians ends. In fact, we get this verse in 2 Timothy 4, 6, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Very different than the way Philippians ends. And so it's possible, likely I would say, in fact, that Paul was released after two years. Maybe his trial never got to Nero. I don't know. Nobody says that it did or didn't. We know Paul wanted to go to Spain, which was on the western rim of the known world, and we know that from the end of Romans. I like to believe that Paul got out of prison in about 62 AD, and he, he went to Spain, and he preached the gospel in Spain, and lots of people got saved. And then somewhere along the way, he was arrested again and imprisoned a second time in Rome. And it was during that time that he wrote 2 Timothy. And I'm willing to accept the tradition then from Clement that he was executed in Rome in the late 60s. Thus ends Paul's amazing witness to the gospel of the Lord Jesus, the witness that we're still going back to in the, in the scriptures today. God finishes what he starts in Jesus by the power of the Spirit. True for the apostles, true for this first generation of believers, true for the apostle Paul, and true for us as well. And so we're at an ending in Acts. But we're also at a new beginning to the way we live because of Acts. So I've listed a few things on your, your little slip there. I put five numbers down. I'm going to tell you about, well, we learned all sorts of things in Acts. I'm going to tell you about three of them. These are three things, three ways that I've changed because of Acts. Because of Acts, we know more about, first of all, what it means to be a witness. You see these first followers of Jesus, the apostles, they're simply, when they get in a tight spot or not, talking about who Jesus is. Who is Jesus and what has he done? He's the son of God who came because we were in darkness, because we were lost and he lived a perfect life and he died on the cross and he took our sins on himself as well as our punishment that we deserve because of our sin and God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus, and by the way, all of this is talked about in the Old Testament, and it was fulfilled in Jesus, and then to show that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice, he raised him from the dead, and Jesus is alive today, and he sent the Spirit, and, 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 and on and on and on. In a broad sense, the gospel is every blessing we have in Christ. 
in a narrow sense that the gospel is all about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then our response to that is the way that we trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. If someone does that, they're in Jesus. They're in Christ. They've entered into the kingdom of God. That's what being a witness is all about. It's not a program. You don't see a program in here. It's not a church ministry that has a budget. It's, it's simply a conversation that we as witnesses have with our neighbors, with our families, sometimes even with ourselves. It should be with ourselves a lot. And, and we simply talk about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. That's what it means to be a witness, and we ought to be talking about Jesus all the time. That's what I've learned from the book of Acts. Second thing, we know more about what the ordinary Christian life looks like. There are extraordinary things in Acts. Things that, spoiler alert, God doesn't do every day. Can we say that? There's some fantastic things that go on in the book of Acts, extraordinary things, but there's ordinary things too. One of the big themes going through Luke Acts is that, is that there is suffering before glory. It was true for Jesus, and it's true for us. Before Jesus was raised from the dead, he went through some pretty ordinary things. Hunger and thirst and abuse and being tired and then being killed, which is common to man. Suffering before glory. And as we read through Acts, we remember that life is hard and then comes glory. Suffering is not something to be avoided. It's something to be embraced and when we go through hard times, it can be physical hard times, sickness, not enough money, depression, mental ugh, turbulence. When the weather's ugh, cold and you're in the middle of winter and you're discouraged, and that's a pretty ordinary thing to feel and we all feel it. And when we go through that, we need to embrace it and let's say together, let's see what God does with this. That's, that's the ordinary Christian life and there is suffering before glory and there is a whole lot of glory in the book of Acts and most of that glory is still ahead of us. That's why this book is so encouraging to me. Third thing, we learn more about who powers our lives. The Spirit of God is the main person in the book of Acts. Think about that a little bit. He's the one that Jesus says he's going to send. I mean, Jesus is always the main person, right? But unlike Luke, Jesus is not walking around with these guys for most of the time, and yet he's present with them in the person of of the Holy Spirit, whom he sends to baptize and fill everybody who has trusted in Jesus. The Spirit is the one who connects us to Jesus. The Spirit is the one who reminds us all that it's all true. He's the one who transforms God's people to help us love and serve the risen and reigning Lord without fear in hope until Jesus returns. Amen. What else have you learned in Acts? I gave you a couple more numbers. Those are just three. List out some more stuff. Meet with a friend group or a friend and say, what have we learned in Acts? The book is fantastic. We won't outlive it. We'll keep reading it and we'll visit it again. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this study that, even though we've done some other stuff, has taken more than three years. That's a, that's a chunk of our lives, Lord. And yet, how well these years were spent and how 
much we've learned and how you've prepared us for what only you know about that we'll, 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 we'll need to do and trust you in as we move forward. Thank you for leading us. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for who you are, Jesus. Thank you for the help that you're coming back and that we're going to see you face to face. And until that time, thank you that we'll be empowered to live out our witness for you before the watching world. And would you come quickly, Lord Jesus? Come quickly so we can be with you. And, and until then, would you gather more and more witnesses to yourself and help us to be faithful to talk about you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for persevering through that, too. It's a long time. So uh, how do we turn this into worship, then? This is something that we're always hesitant to do when we hear something amazing. And the glory of God is before us uh, in his word. We, we have to take it then and we have to let it uh, ruminate. We have to let it sit there and, and or in, in my, med- my world, percolate. <laughs> we have to let it sit. And it's helpful to have words that are maybe poetic, or they capture these thoughts, and then they, we hear ourselves speak them, and our hearts respond, and it's responding in worship. We do it with song, because it puts us all on the same page, right? So we're going we're gonna to close with, with two songs. One is a song of worship, that we have to take in the words, we have to let them sit there, and then it pops out as worship. And the second one is a prayer. <clears throat> What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love and boundless That's better, yeah. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ. is dark. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. There in
the, the family that sweats together. <laughs> Tastes together. <laughs> Does something. Uh, oh, <laughs> man. Hey, remember Brad's instructions about what we're doing here? So children in the grove today, adults in, in here. And now go into all the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all men. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.